Good morning, everybody. Wow, that's some energy. What a receptive audience. OK, what was our key learning from yesterday? Pigeonhole is your friend in an interactive presentation. So please, as this is an interactive presentation, uh, open pigeonhole. What you may not have learned yesterday, and particularly for those who appear to have enjoyed last night, is pigeonhole does not spell or grammar correct. So be careful what you type in. I won't be afraid to call that out. Um, it's an interactive session today. Um, I'll be talking about some global and regional trends and how they apply to uh, Asia and China. And then we'll be joined by Mary Boyd from The Economist Group. Uh, Mary has spent the bulk of her career here in Asia in a range of diplomatic and economic advisory roles. However, Mary had no say in the walk-on music. We're increasingly living in a unilateral world, and the choice of Banana Rama was mine and solely mine. But I want to start off with the topic of this presentation, uh, East meets West. Uh, and it really does refer fairly narrowly to the economic domain. Um, we are seeing the East start to converge to the West in terms of the economic cycle. But in terms of our commercial business and the commercial opportunities that we want to identify, we need to look at economic cycles, at demographic cycles, at digital cycles, at technology cycles, more structural cycles. And when we step back and take all of those cycles into totality, what we find is that the process of convergence is perhaps one more of the West meeting the East. And that is what I wanted to talk you through today, how all these moving parts in terms of digital connectivity, income growth, are coming together to really see many moving parts in terms of the economic outlook and how the economy is progressing. But one thing that we can be fairly certain on is that 2017 was the peak in this business cycle. And that the business cycle will continue to moderate, probably to around 2020, 2021. And this is how an economist typically looks at the business or economic cycle. We move from a period of recession, where policymakers support an economy uh, through stimulatory policy, into recovery, and then that recovery is sustained by confidence into expansion. And then we move into late cycle dynamics, and an economy starts to slow and moves into slowdown. And if we use the US as an example in this most recent cycle, the US was in recession in 2007, 2008. We saw stimulatory policy support the recovery uh, around 2009. And then we've moved through an expansion, uh, which was aided by more recent tax cuts. Uh, but now the US economy is starting to moderate. And some economists are forecasting that the first quarter of negative growth in the US could occur as soon as Q3 2020 or in early 2021. So the cycle is about 10 years. And globally, there have been four recessions, five recessions since 1950. So we can assume that this cycle runs for around 10 to 15 years. So 2017 was where we're identifying the peak in this business cycle. The majority of the world's economies were in the recovery and expansion phase. Then as we moved into 2018, we started to see more economies slow. The Chinese, the US cycle mature, China's managed transition continue, the woes of Brexit uh, wane somewhat, and we think this will continue into 2019 and 2020. 
And economists are spending a lot of time talking about the nature of the likely next US recession. Uh, will it be a balance sheet recession, a financial recession, or merely an economic slowdown? But I think that misses the point entirely because by the time we move through to the next stage of this recovery in around 24 to 36 months, this will be the last recession or business cycle slowdown the US ever experiences as the world's largest economy. Because by the time we move into the recovery phase, China will have overtaken the US to become the world's largest economy. And then if we move around that cycle one more time, another 10 to 15 years, India will have displaced the US into third place and become the world's second largest economy. And these transitions are incredibly rare. They normally happen once a century. So the US displaced the British Empire in 1915 to become the world's largest economy. And before that, the British Empire displaced France in 1815 at the end of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary Wars to become the world's largest economy. So these dynamics, which economists typically measure in centuries, one of them will occur in the next 36 months. And that should be the focus and anchor of our commercial decision making. And it really is the beginning of a period of one of the most significant changes in the demographic and geographical composition of growth that we're likely to see. So just as we go through how the global economy is likely to evolve, from now to 2030 and into 2050, we can see some really interesting trends that start to emerge. Some of the old G7 or G20 economies fall out of the picture altogether. We have some new arrivals, but over the course of the next cycle, China will likely overtake the US to become the world's largest economy. By the time we move through the next decade, China and India will have overtaken the US, which will have fallen into third place. 2020 to 2030 is likely to be peak Asia, with Indonesia moving into third place. And whilst many call this the Asian century, when we look at the dynamics from 2050 onwards, we start to see the rapid rise of Africa and the Middle East and North Africa. And that's what makes this coming business cycle slowdown so important. Because the way the economy and the consumer looks beforehand and the way the economy and the consumer will look after is going to be fundamentally different on a demographic and a structural basis. So one of the fluid parts of the global economy at the moment is obviously what's happening with trade and tariffs. Um, these dynamics continue to change. Uh, one of the changes which makes economic analysis a little bit more difficult is that policy is increasingly announced by tweet, uh, often overnight. This is what we thought the tariff measures the US was imposing looked like. Uh, this is what we're now starting to see. The scale and extent of US tariffs being put on a range of goods is changing and changing rapidly. And one of the difficulties when we have policy announced in an incremental way, when policy is announced by Twitter, is that it's hard to get or capture the full scope of it. Um, the number of countries that now have tariffs applied to them, the number of tariff lines, goods, services, linkages to supply chains. And we're starting to reach the point where the incremental change in the tariff structure may no longer have a marginal impact.
And one of the most important measures of economic protectionism was the Smoot-Hawley Act of 1930. The US economy was struggling. Uh, the Smoot-Hawley Act put tariffs on a range of goods, around 900 goods. And in the year after the Smoot-Hawley Act was introduced, global trade fell by 65%. The US unemployment rate rose from 5% to 20%. Global GDP contracted by around 15%. And the incremental change in the number of goods or tariffs as a share of the total value of imports that has been announced to date is larger than what was announced by the Smoot-Hawley Act. So we need to be more mindful of how the ground is shifting on globalization and particularly on supply chains and where goods are sourced from and where goods are shipped to in the global world. And an example of this is that the longer term damage to trade relationships could have lasting impacts. And there's a very, very interesting video on YouTube by an economist in the US who decided to prove that you could live in a world without trade, that the US could be self-sufficient and not reliant on imports from China. And to prove this, his example was making a chicken sandwich from beginning. So he grew the wheat, he milled the wheat and made the flour. He raised a chicken from an egg, thereby also answering that important existential question. Um, he distilled seawater into salt, he grew the pepper, he grew the vegetables, he baked the bread, and that entire process took him six months and cost him 1,500 US dollars. He could have gone to Subway and bought the equivalent for three dollars. So, Global trade has allowed for the distribution of labor and capital according to skills and according to comparative advantage. And what we're showing here is the number of workers each economy would need to add in a no trade world. And we can see for North America that North America would need to add 34 million new workers to cover the goods it currently imports and produces them. But the US economy is at full employment. So to create those new 34 million jobs, it would need to reallocate its existing workers. So tech workers in Silicon Valley, bankers, finances in Wall Street Journal would have to become coal miners in Pittsburgh or auto workers in Detroit. Ultimately, it leads to lower productivity in the medium term. And a great example of this is the Toyota Camry. The Toyota Camry is perhaps one of the icons of globalization because when an economy reaches middle income status, it typically moves into auto production. When an economy uh, reaches middle income status on the demand side, it typically buys Toyota Camrys. And what I'm showing here is the number of weeks of worker salaries, it's typically taken a US worker to purchase a Toyota Camry. And what we consider the peak period of globalization, 96 to 2016, that declined from 33 weeks to 22 weeks. But with now supply chains being disrupted, goods being produced in China, uh, subject to tariffs, we expect to see the price of physically produced goods uh, rise in price. And when the world's largest producer and exporter and the world's largest importer and consumer, China and the US, start putting barriers and taxes on the goods they produce, there's one result, and that will be higher inflation. So we expect to see higher inflation in those type of goods that are physically distributed and we're likely to continue to see disinflation in e-commerce and digital platforms. So this rotation of consumption 
from goods to services is likely to be aided by this because physically produced and distributed goods will become more expensive. Uh, digitally exchanged goods, services, experiences are likely to continue falling in price. And we're already starting to see this impact of trade disputes being felt. This is a survey by both the American Chamber of Commerce uh, in China um, and some local chambers of commerce. And we can see that it's actually American companies that are feeling the major impact uh, of the trade measures to date. They're losing market share. Uh, one in Asia, in China, there's pushback to their products. Um, they're not being purchased, so their rationale for moving to China to access lower labor costs has really been lost. Uh, their rationale to access a, a large domestic market has also been lost. And how they're responding to this is by planning to move their production or extend their supply chains into Southeast Asia. And the majority of companies who have been affected by this are moving their supply chains as we speak. So what we expect to see is this process of the world's center of production or economic uh, center of gravity is once again starting to move. And historically, the economic center of gravity has been determined by the distribution of population, of machines, and technology. And over time, we can track how that has moved by looking at those resources. So from year zero to 1500, when population was the sole determinant of economic weight, the economic center of gravity basically was halfway between China and India in the Ganges Basin, because that's where 80% of the global population lived. And what we saw with the Industrial Revolution and the introduction of machines was the displacement of people. And the economic center of gravity moved to Western Europe and the UK, despite Western Europe and the UK only having 11% of the population. And then with the invention of advanced machines in the beginning of the computing age, that economic center of gravity moved towards the US, despite the US only having 60% of the global population. And then in the 1970s and 80s, it was like the world's multinationals collectively thought, wouldn't it be a great idea if we improved our profits and improved our efficiencies by shifting our production center back to low labor cost centers. And this current wave of globalization commenced. And by 2007, we had an equal distribution between economic weight and population. And we expect that to continue through to 2050. And that journey to have completed. Now we can be fairly sure of the population forecast, bar barring famine, war, or um, pestilence, they're fairly sticky. We can be fairly sure of the foreign direct investment numbers because they have a 10 to 15 year lead. So technology becomes the uncertainty. And how we proxy te uh, technology is looking at innovation via patents. And what I'm showing here is the number of patents that have been filed uh, in each country from 1966 to 2016. And this has typically been dominated by Japan and the US. But then, around 2006, that changed dramatically. China became the first economy to file more than one million patents in a single year. Patents tend to apply to processes. Um, if we look at trademarks, which tend to apply to brands, to goods, again, this was a European and US dynamic up until 2016. And then in 2016, China became the first economy to file more than two million trademarks. And when I meet with our US and our European economists and we discuss this, they say to me, Glenn, how can this be the case? 
if China is stealing our technology, how can they be patenting more? And what we're capturing here, they kind of put it in more economic terms than that, but what we're capturing here is how quickly China is moving into a digital ecosystem. Um, work I did with the World Economic Forum found the average Chinese millennial was comfortable multitasking on five screens simultaneously. So when they're in that environment, uh, when they're in a WeChat uh, environment, probably the games they're playing have been trademarked. The processes they're using have been patented. And this is really capturing how quickly China is moving from a physical into a digital ecosystem. But these differentials are incredibly important from an economic perspective as well. If we look at Japan and the US as evidence of this, in 1970, Japan hosted the World Expo in Osaka. It's when brands like Toyota, Honda, Fujitsu, Sony were introduced to the world for the first time. The CD player, the Walkman, the Betamax, the VCR. Suddenly, Japanese goods became more competitively priced and more desirable in the global economy than US goods. And if we look at that ratio of innovation to economic performance, this was the period when Japan was converging on the US economy, when Reagan and Bush were putting protectionist measures on Japanese goods, and when it was viewed that Japan was going to overtake the US to become the world's largest economy. And what ended this was the Plaza Accord of 1985, when Japan agreed to appreciate the yen by 50%. Suddenly its goods became uncompetitive in the global marketplace, its companies unprofitable, and its banking market and debt and non-performing loans became obvious. And I think as we look at the trade war and the current measures, this provides two important lessons. Once these innovation differentials have fallen into place, they provide a tremendous advantage that is measured in years, not months, but they're also very, very sensitive to currency movements as well. The other dynamic that we're seeing, in addition to the economic center of gravity returning to Asia and technology pivoting to Asia, is the world's largest cities are moving to the east. One, as a result of demographics in the west, two, as a result of urbanization in the east. And if we look at where the world's 25 largest urban agglomerations were located in 1950, and then compare that to 1990, and then our forecast for 2030, we can see that it's the east that's urbanizing, the east which will be defined by cities. And by 2050, the population of Asia is expected to be around 6.2 billion people. If we assume a 50% urbanization rate, that will be around 3.2 billion people who will be living in cities. So let's do a little thought exercise. If those 3.2 billion people lived in a city that had the population density of Tokyo to Osaka, you would need an urban area of 3.2 million square miles to house them. That's the size of the Indian subcontinent. If they lived in an area that had the urban density of New York, Boston, Washington, you would need an area of 6.2 million square kilometers or miles to house them. That's the size of the Australian subcontinent. So the Asian city of the future is likely to be a continuous urban agglomeration that runs from Beijing down to Shanghai, Hong Kong, up into Vietnam, down the Vietnamese, Thai, Malaysian Peninsula, across the Indonesian archipelago that is 12,000 kilometers long and 5,000 kilometers inland. So our notions of connectivity, the future of work, all of that have to change given how Asia is urbanizing and the population dynamic. Now maps affect our perception of reality.
And this map is showing how the world looks simply from a territorial perspective. This is how we should look at the world from a population perspective. And what you can see, don't take a picture of the map next to the one that makes me look large. Um, what you can see is that population is going to be centered in Asia. The two largest geographical regions, Russia and Canada, merely become slivers between the Arctic buffers. And when we add a digital overlay to this, we start to see a much more interesting story. We probably globally are at the point of peak penetration. 80% of adults now use the internet. But that's been a slow churn. That's come from the West using landlines. It's now an elderly population with a slower churn in terms of adopting technology. When we look at smartphone adoption, this has largely been an Asia story. It's picked up very, very quickly. But there's this gap between penetration and usage. And how and where is that gap going to close? Most probably in Asian cities. And West meets East invites us to challenge our perceptions of the old world versus the new world. This is the price of a smartphone in the US versus India, a smartish phone in India, one that doesn't have touch screen capabilities but can run apps. It's $1,000 compared to $15. Competition in the telephone sector in India has seen data usage in India become a fraction of that of the US. And the average Indian citizen consumes three times as much data per month as a US citizen. So that usage gap is going to be closed by connectivity. And as more and more people become connected for the first time, connectivity is accelerating. And what I'm showing here is how long it has taken a new invention to reach 50 million users. 50 years for the telephone, 28 years for the credit card, 22 years for the television, 18 years for the ATM, 14 years for computers, 12 years for mobile phones, 7 years for the internet, 3 years for Facebook, 19 days for Pokemon Go. So connectivity is accelerating. And that is where the usage and penetration gap is going to close. And we're already seeing how this is affecting social dynamics when we layer that on top of some of the structural demographics we have in Asia. Every day in Asia, even though leading politicians can't reach an agreement, 11,000 people are added to the labor force. 120,000 people will move from rural areas to cities. 372,000 people will access the internet for the first time. 1,000 industrial robots are added to productive capacity. 33,500 new household units are formed. 353,000 people join a social media network. And these dynamics occur every single day. And they won't be interrupted or disrupted by a tariff war or trade barriers because they're to do with the domestic nature of the populations and their structural distribution of growth and the age of their population. So we can be confident that these are going to continue and that these should be the commercial anchors that we're focusing on. But the point I want to conclude on is how we look at cities. And to start to introduce the notion that as walls go up between countries, the importance of adopting a city-to-city -city strategy. Now, more than 50% of households are middle class. More than 50% live in cities. 
And when we look at how the Asian economies modernized, industrialized, and converged, if we look at a Singapore, a Hong Kong, a Tokyo, it really was ownership. It was when households owned appliances similar to those of the West that they were considered to be middle class. So the old model of convergence was both based on an ownership dynamic. When we look at how this new urban cohort we see emerging is going to converge, there's going to be two differences which are based on breaks in consumer preferences. The first is ownership. We will never see a convergence of car ownership. Together, India, China, and Indonesia will bring one billion new first-time consumers to market. If each of those consumers bought a car, the entire area of Asia devoted to agricultural production would need to be paved over merely to park those cars. So the first break is from ownership to sharing, the use of Grab, Uber, Gojek, etc. The second is disruption. Countries are not going to roll out landlines. People are not going to use desktop computers to access the internet. They're going to use tablets and they're going to use their mobile phones. And we're already seeing the mobile phone starting to converge as a result of that. In fact, it's overtaking it. So digital connectivity via mobile devices and the fact that we could see 5G in Asia first is going to see a leapfrogging of technological convergence and favor a Asian consumer whose preferences are online, whose influences are formed online, whose aspirations are formed online, and who will transact predominantly via the convergence of influence and commerce in the mobile phone. And on that, I would like to hand over to our next speaker, Mary Boyd from The Economist Group, who is going to talk us through a more local and focused deep dive into the China economy. And then I will be rejoining Mary on the stage for a fireside chat, which is approximately 75 meters long. Um, and that is where you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of either Mary or myself. So thank you very much for your time this morning and your attention.